Hi there, uh, my name is Adam Cannon and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about primitive data types in Java. So before we start talking about primitive data types in Java, we need to maybe focus a little bit on what is an actual computer program. I think you probably think you know what a computer program and maybe you do. Um, maybe you do know what, what it is, but um, I want to just take a, a high end look at it and, and, and then we can talk about data manipulation because actually that is what a computer program does. It takes in data represented symbolically, it manipulates that data, and then it outputs symbolic data. Okay, now that manipulation happens because there's a set of very specific instructions telling the computer exactly what to do. Um, those instructions are your computer program. So programming is simply a way of articulating very specific instructions that your computer can execute to do whatever it is that you want to automate. Now, I talked about data coming in and data coming out. What does that mean? That's just information data. Information is coming in, information is coming out. We have to represent that information in some way or another. Okay, so in Java, there's a lot of different ways to infer, represent information, but there are a few that are the sort of elemental or atomic units of information that are part of the Java language. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. We call those primitive data types. Now, in Java, there's actually eight primitive data types, but I'm going to focus on two for now. All right. Integers, those are just, you know, what integers are. They're whole numbers, uh, positive or negative, and floating point numbers. So those are numbers that just have a fractional part. Okay. Now, in Java, we use the following two data types to represent uh, these kinds of numbers. We use ints to represent integers, and we use doubles to represent floating point numbers. Now, there are others. I'm not telling you the whole truth, but that's part of my job as a teacher. Um, we'll get back to the whole truth eventually. I'll, I'll resolve all the lies I tell you and I'll fill you in on everything as we go. But for now, let's just focus on whole numbers and not whole numbers. So let's do a little bit of live coding and actually see what we're talking about uh, with respect to these different primitive data types, okay? Now this is a very, very elementary Java program that's simply there to um, demonstrate how we can declare and how we can actually uh, manipulate these data types that I'm talking about. So remember we saw in the last slide ints and we saw doubles. Those are for representing for numbers that have a fractional portion. Those would be doubles. And double, by the way, it stands for double precision floating point number. You don't need to know exactly the whole, you know, why we call it that, but that's what it stands for in case you're wondering. And int obviously stands for integer. Now you've probably seen some very basic Java programs before, and, and this is an example of one of those. All I wanted to do here was demonstrate that this portion here that I've highlighted, this is us declaring an integer called num. It's a variable of type int called num. This is a declaration. Declaration accomplishes, well, three or four things, only two of which we'll describe here. You're not ready to know the whole truth about declaration, unfortunately, but you will be within a few more lectures, I think. Now, for now, what all we're actually accomplishing here is we're telling Java, hey, Java, I want to have a variable that the kind of animal that that variable is going to be, that the data type that that variable is going to be is an integer. That is a variable, you can think of it as a bin with a name, as a box with a name, and we're putting information in that box. So num is just the box that we're going to put integers in. That's what that int num does. It tells Java, hey, I'm going to have a variable, its name is num, and the kinds of information I'm going to store in that variable uh, it is an integer, okay? Um, the next line here, we're actually assigning a value to num. We're giving it the value three, right? Three is an integral value and we're storing that integral value in the variable num. So two different things have happened here. First, we've declared the variable num. Next, we've assigned a value to the variable num, all right? So we've initialized the variable as num with the value three in this case. Uh, declaration essentially allocates memory, gives that memory a name, and 
tells Java how to interpret the ones and zeros that are stored in that memory location. That is, look at that as an int. All right, that's all that's happening there. On the next line here, what we're actually doing is, you know, walking and chewing gum at the same time. We are declaring and initializing a variable here. So we've declared the variable other num, all right, as type double. This time the number has um, a fractional or could have a fractional portion. I've just called it 4.0 in this case. We've assigned it, we've initialized it to the value 4.0, right? Like your GPA. If we go back, I could have just done four, right? I could have just assigned this, uh, the variable four, uh, and that would be the actual same thing, but it's polite to be very clear that this has a fractional portion. Even if it's 0.0, we put the 0.0 because we want people to, it, we want it to be extremely obvious that this is not an int, that this is actually a double, that it, even though it's a round number, it has the possibility of having a fractional portion. This is important, folks, right? Especially, what if I declared other num as a double way someplace else, right? And, you know, hundreds of lines above in a large program. Better to have it as a 4.0. Um, when you're assigning variables, just again, to remind yourself that this is a double. Because ints and doubles, they behave differently. You're going to see this as time goes on. Now we've just summed them. I've summed them using a double here. So if I actually run this program, what, what will end up seeing is I'm going to print the sum is and then the value of sum, which is what? 3 plus 4.0. So if we run this, if I first compile this program, and now I run it, what do we see? We see the sum is 7.0, right? Because sum has been stored as a double. So Java prints 7.0. What happens if I try this? Int. What if we store sum as a double? Do you think this will work? Let's have a look. When we try to compile now, what has happened? We've gotten an error right here. We've received an error right here. Um, because we've tried adding a double and an integer and stored it in an integer. Before, we didn't have an error when we were storing these things in a double. And that's because of the following. This is, the double, pardon me, I am in New York City. This is Columbia University. So sirens are unfortunately uh, a common occurrence. Um, a double is a set of uh, numbers that include fractional portions, but include the integers, right? So it's okay for me to widen. It's okay for me to take integers, add them to doubles, and end up with a double. But it's not okay for me to take integers and add them to doubles and end up with this narrower type, the int, okay? And if I do do that, I have to explicitly cast it. I have to tell Java specifically that I understand that I may lose information if I store a number like 4.6 in an integer as an integer value. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here is it's okay to add integers with doubles as long as you're storing that out that outcome as a double. All right. So the integer num here in some sense gets promoted to uh, a double when when it's added to another double. And that result, which is a double, is stored in the value sum. Now, if all of that sounds complicated to you, don't worry about it. It's not the main point of this lecture. The main point of this lecture is that in Java, right, again, let's just take a step back and remember what, what the name of the game is. We're taking information in. We need to represent that information somehow. We manipulate that information. That's what a program does. And then we output information. So when I say information, what the heck am I talking about? Well, I can be talking about a lot of different things. I can be talking about numbers. I can be talking about numbers that have fractional parts. I can be talking about whole numbers. I can be talking about ints, that is the whole numbers. That's how we represent them in Java. Or I can be talking about doubles, numbers that have a fractional part. How those things play together, which is an example of what I've just shown you, is something that you're going to learn as you go. But for now, it's important to understand that there are different kinds of information in Java. We've just seen two. Let's see what the other six sort of elemental forms of information in Java actually are. 
So we just saw a short program where we had two different kinds of numbers in Java. We had whole numbers, ints, and we had numbers that had a fractional portion. We called those doubles. And more generally, those kinds of numbers are represented using what we call, they're called floating point numbers. And we use a, a double stands for double uh, precision floating point numbers. Now, in fact, Java has more than just those two numeric types. In fact, there are six numeric types in Java. Four different kinds of integers, two different kinds of floating point numbers. Why so many different types of numbers? It all has to do with memory. So the four different types of integers in Java each use a different amount of memory. Now remember when we were talking about declaration, I said it accomplishes a few different things. One, when we declared the variable num before, it was telling Java, I like to personify Java, think of Java as this entity that we're interacting with now. It tells Java that, hey, I'm gonna have a variable called num and it's gonna be an int, it's going to be a whole assigned whole number, okay? Um, what Java does then is it sets aside some memory for that variable. Now, when we declared it as int, it set aside four bytes, 32 bits of memory for that variable. That, that limits the size of our number, right? With 32 bits, I can only represent a number that's so big. What if I want a bigger number? Well, I can use a different encoding scheme to represent larger numbers that, use, that uses more memory namely a long. So a long is just a different, it's an integer that uses more memory so that you can represent bigger numbers. Well, why not just use long and, and forget about it? So I'm sure we have a big enough number. Well, because we want to conserve memory when possible. Often we're dealing with numbers that are not huge. In that case, we could use byte or short or int, an integer that uses a smaller amount of memory. So we have these four different types of integers uh, because they each use different amounts of memory and our memory requirements can vary depending on the task at hand. So we like to be frugal about the amount of memory we use and therefore we have these different types of integers and we wanna use the appropriate one uh, given, given the task at hand. Now you might say, well, what if, uh, what if we wanna represent a number even bigger than a long? And yeah, that's a, that's a real issue. Uh, when that happens, there are ways of dealing with that. And we don't use a primitive type in those situations. We use something else that you're gonna learn about down the road. But with 64 bits of memory, you can represent pretty big integers. Now with re respect to floating point numbers, it's the same game. We have two different types of floating num point numbers, not six because, or rather not four, but as we do with integers, we just have floats and doubles. Doubles use eight bytes, floats use four bytes. So 64 bits versus 32 bits. We don't really have smaller uh, memory usage among floating point numbers because since they have that fractional portion, we want, we want a certain level of precision. So four bytes is the minimum and eight bytes is the maximum, or at least uh, if, as long as we're gonna stay primitive. Once again, if we need really high precision numbers, let's say we're doing some scientific computation or something, uh, and we want very precise, and we have big numbers with, we need a lot of significant digits, there are solutions for that. We can do different things when we need more precision than eight bytes provides for us. That said, uh, for everything we're gonna be doing in this semester, this is going to more than suffice uh, for our memory needs. Now, this is, these are all numeric types. Information is, just, is not just numbers though, right? So in Java or in any computer program, the kinds of information coming in could be numeric, as it is here, but it could also be something else. It could be text, uh, could be other stuff. Now in Java, these six primitive types are all reserved for uh, numerics, but we have these two, two other primitive types that are reserved for other things. So this, this character prim primitive type uh, uses what's called a Unicode encoding. You may have seen this before when you're adjusting or configuring programs on, on your computer. You see sometimes UTF-8 or UTF-32 or UTF-16. That is, uh, that stands for a Unicode type encoding. So that's just, how are we going to interpret the ones and zeros as which characters? What does this sequence of ones and zeros mean? What character does it correspond to? That's the Unicode encoding scheme. Java uses 
Um, a Unicode encoding scheme for characters. That's another kind of animal, another kind of data type. So we can assign variables to be characters if we want. Uh, and also Booleans, which are simply just true or false values. Sometimes, uh, you know, that's the easiest kind of math, right? Something's true or something's false. One of two possible values. So in Java, uh, characters use um, exactly uh, two bytes. So 16 bits that gives us uh, a total possibility of two to the 16 potentially different characters, right? That's 32,000 different possible characters. Um, that's a lot. I'm sorry, 32,000. Two to the 32 is, is more like 65,000 plus. My apologies. Um, so that's a lot of different characters. That's great. So we can represent all the characters we need using this data type. And then Booleans, really, how much memory do we need to use to represent a Boolean? If it can only have true or false value, why not just assign like true is one or zero is false, or we really just need one bit, right? But we can't really allocate one bit. So typically we use one byte. The truth is, the dirty truth is, um, and for Booleans in Java, it really depends on the situation, how much memory is going to be allocated. Uh, but you can think of it as a byte. I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to think of Booleans being stored in as a single byte, which again is, is a lot of waste, eight bits when we really only need one. But it has to do with how um, how finely we can allocate memory on a computer. So think of Booleans as using one byte of memory. The truth is, because I don't want to lie to you, because I'm not going to see you again later to resolve the lie. The truth is uh, that the amount of memory job allocates for Booleans varies depending on the situation. Think of it as a byte, though. In any case, that's it. Those are the eight different primitive types and their memory allocations in Java. So what did we see? We saw six different types for storing numeric data. These are their memory allocations. Not difficult to remember how much each type requires, right? Is it difficult for you to remember that a byte requires a byte of memory? I don't think so. I don't think it should be. You're in an AP class. You got this. Um, and from there, just remember this order, byte, short, int, long. And then their memory requirements go up by powers of two, like everything else in computer science. So it goes two to the zero, that's one, one byte. Two to the one, that's two, two bytes, that's a short. Two to the two, that's four bytes, that's an int. Two to the three, that's eight bytes, that's a long. Floats and doubles, four and eight, you just gotta remember it. Uh, the Unicode encoding, we use UTF-16 in Java, so it's, it's two bytes. And Booleans, well, the smallest amount of memory you can typically allocate in a computer is one byte. Uh, and so you can think of them that way. But again, like I mentioned before, the truth is it's kind of weird. It varies. Uh, but think of it, I think it's perfectly okay to think of it as one byte. That's primitive types. That's how Java rep sort of in the, in the most basic sense, in the most elemental way, represents information. But what you're going to see next when you start learning about classes is that these eight primitive data types are more like a periodic table for building more complicated structures, more complicated data types. And the key feature for object-oriented programming is that we don't limit the number of data types we can have. You can, a user, can create, and when I say user, I mean a programmer, can create whatever kinds of data types they need at the time. So if we go back to the beginning, think about a computer program, information coming in, manipulating that information, information going out, what flavors does that information come in? What we've learned today is that there are eight primitive types that Java uses for, for representing that kind of information coming in and out. And what you're going to learn down the road is that we can actually build whatever kinds of types we feel are necessary at the time, uh, but it all starts with these sort of basic building block types, these primitive types. One thing, one last word, you may have noticed that strings were not here among our primitive types. And it's true, strings are not primitives in Java. So 
you'll learn that they, they, they do have some special status in Java. I, I like to think of them as, as Neanderthals. They're almost primitive. They have certain primitive behaviors, but they are not quite primitives. They are actually more sophisticated data types that you will learn about down the road. I think that's it for now. Uh, I hope you hope you enjoyed this and that you get something out of the, this whole series of lectures. You guys have a great day.